I am Dr. Rasika Taskar Berewar, co-founder of AAA Healthcare. I am your host and the moderator for this session. At the outset, let me thank Nat Health for putting this session, much needed session together. Nat Health is an integrator with a vision to be a credible unified voice in, an, in improving an access and quality of healthcare in India. Nat Health has played a, a large role with its leadership and members in diverse fields. Playing multiple roles as collaborators, think tanks, advocates, they have helped to forge partnerships, deepen the relationship with the, the government, shaped up policies and regulations, and have been torchbearers to represent as well as safeguard the interest of healthcare providers during challenging times. So, uh, pertaining to our session today, the last seven months have been unprecedented difficult time for us globally. The sudden surge of COVID-19 has challenged the entire system, in fact, all systems at various levels. India's public health response was homogenous and centralized with an SOP being laid down by the government. Multiple roles, uh, multiple steps were taken. Initially, there was a rush of creating facilities. There was procurement rushes for ventilators, clinical protocols that were changed so frequently, invoking on Ayush doctors to be a part of this, to face this whole situation. A flood of online training, workshops, and uh, lots of app, predictive model. There was tremendous noise during that phase. With the system going completely awry for a non-COVID emergency patient at one level, and with most other medical colleges closing doors on regular classes and resorting to online mediums, we lost out probably on invaluable learning there. The shakeup has been immense. But now, seven to eight months down the, in this, into this COVID experience, we all have fought this war of COVID with our backs to the wall. And now we have some basic milestones that we that un, we understand some basic milestones that we need to combat this pandemic. With this experience, can we assemble some building blocks to create an ecosystem to strengthen our processes of capacity building, training, upscaling of healthcare providers and medical students? As this has emerged as one of the most salient feature and the most required feature to face any pandemic. On another hand, we also have uh, a Skilling India movement, which was launched by our honorable prime minister. And this movement is in for creation of for job creations and entrepreneurships across all classes. The Health Sector Skill Council and the National Skill Development Corporations have been assigned the job to create an enormous pool of skilled personnel. Uh, numbers vary from 25 million to 80 million. So in this talk, what would we like to have today? We would like to discuss some pointers, some thoughts, some ideas that would help organizations like NatHealth to carry forward these ideas into our leadership and have some policy changes. We'd we would like to look at some paradigm shift to be addressed in the way we are looking at uh, skilling today in response to our present day landscape. And we need to plan out something for our future in terms of skilling. So we have uh, on our panel to discuss all of this four extremely eminent personalities each of them with tremendous length and breadth of experience in healthcare and otherwise also behind them. Minds that, are ha that have created uh, structures, minds that, that, that can think through all this maze and can help us find a proper pathway in this process of health learning. So let me introduce to you our eminent panelists for today. First one is Mr. Gautam Khanna, CEO of Hinduja Hospital. Our guest for uh, today has admitted in his hospital the first COVID patient in uh, Mumbai at his Hinduja Hospital. Second guest is Dr. Uma Nambiar, who is an executive director of Gym Care Hospitals Kerala, chairperson of Digital Health India Associates. Our 
next guest is mr puneet kohli managing director prisenius medical medical care we are so happy to have puneet with us who represents an untapped sector which is the medical te- uh, uh, medical technology sector for skilling and finally dr iraji vyarvadekar dean and a stalwart education dean of sibasis university and a stalwart educationist i am so happy to have all of you here this is an appropriate absolutely an appropriate panel two from the demand side two people to uh, from the demand side one person from the supply side and one person who sits at the center fold who has amalgamated several policies that is dr uma several policies and is also a part of the it uh, world uh thank you so much all my panelists for being a part of this and without much ado let me ask my first question to uh, mr gautam khanna so so can you share a few experiences and and some words about your um the status of covid then back then in march and how has your hospital hinduja progress since then uh, how did you deal with the situation what measures were taken to scale up in terms of doctors nurses paramedics what were the steps what are the steps being taken to prepare the healthcare workforce for an overload that may happen sometime in the future so uh, dr rashika thank you so much for asking so it's a, a lot of things to be said in a short while but uh, let me uh, try my best so i i'll just uh, break the challenges uh, how we managed covid into four buckets and then i will try and link it to what was the common theme throughout uh, this so the four buckets were infrastructure you already talked about that that all of us were required to make separate infrastructure for covid and we have to understand that uh, at that time lockdown was uh, prevalent and the labor was not there the other uh, aspect was availability of people that we needed staff to be available whether it was nurses doctors you know the attendants and people to in purchase to buy things people in engineering so you just needed people and then you needed to provide them training and motivation so that was a second uh, bucket the third was like you had mentioned that now no one knew anything so the protocols were coming every day so every sometimes twice a day the government was issuing advisories so we had to be uh, you know ready to make changes as we go along and then there were complete uh, regulations in in terms of the clinical expertise and so on so having said that what what was then so in march when we got our first patient 12th march when we got our first covid patient diagnosed in a hospital to now that time there was a environment of fear there was an environment of unknown we did not know what is what is the right thing to be done because we saw the examples in italy we saw in wuhan we saw in the us and some other countries and in in india in kerala and other states so you really were trying to figure out what is the right thing to do and i am uh, and and now the situation is that now things seem to have been set in a pattern so we know what is the treatment protocol whatever is the established government guidelines international guidelines people are trained infra- infrastructure is ready protocols are made so all that is done but i think the common theme across all this of course it was pretty challenging i'm i'm making it sound very easy but it was pretty challenging that teams were meeting every day for hours and even on sundays and they were taking decisions for the day and if any new advisory came they would revise the decision the next day so it was learning on the job and the thing is what we learned that earlier we said that we don't have the skill we don't have the knowledge we cannot do it now what we learned was that if we were able to harness the collective knowledge of various uh, people whether it is doctors nurses experts surgeons you know medical experts medicine experts they would get the expertise from their international colleagues or national colleagues and we would quickly collate and make a protocol so i think the knowledge aspect we learned how to get the knowledge very quickly 
in in this uh, environment and all of us did i mean other hospitals also did that so the point is we had to we got knowledge and then the issue was people were going back home because they were scared their parents were calling them home nurses young girls were going back home the doctors young doctors were going back home so we had to think of ways how to keep them here and then how to train them to manage the covid thing so for example we requested the dnb for an extended stay for the students we increased the salary of uh, you know a few category of people we have given them some allowances went ahead and got more recruitment consultants and all the technicians and and the staff who are covered under the skilling india category we took care of them by giving them accommodation giving them you know some uh, other so basically an assurance that if something happens to them we will take care of them we will treat them we take took care of the families so you know the overall management of people and skilling of people was the key point in all this uh, uh, in in this epidemic and the last thing before i hand over back to you arska is that we when when covid struck we all thought that covid is to be managed only by chest physicians because that's what you know respiratory issue is but then later on we found that other people could also do it so then we put other specialities other mds as part of rota and they came and they learnt on the job so people who were not from that speciality whether it was doctors nurses technicians att- attendants whoever everybody who put, we put on the job we got them trained and we had uh, regular trainings for them you know uh, online and offline with of course social distancing and you know you ensured that their skill levels went up to what we needed for covid uh, management and i'm happy to say that the practices which we uh, developed in the hospital later on became a benchmark and best practice for across the city the other hospitals to follow so i think there are i mean a short time difficult to say but i think lots of things were done and focus was on employees and getting the knowledge and getting the skills up basically all right uh another thing that i'd like to ask you is uh, there was a directive since you so closely work with the government um there was a directive by the government on march 26 which was uh, 2020 and they had laid down some protocols for training and online uh, online training so uh, rather a entire map that was there how far was that adhered to you think so was that successful any learning lessons from that so we uska <clears throat> we do um, we have we run uh, allied healthcare training courses in in 11 categories so we have i mean till now we have done around 500 plus students and that so that is a one like one year course so for those people we had to continue but obviously we moved to an online module and and of course linked to what the government has advised so we moved to that and it was blended learning in the sense that for some reason they have to come for practicals to the hospital and do online uh, you know not online was not enough but you know some of those students were really scared so they would not come so only people who were exist already working in the hospital in some manner would come so we i we were not able to tap the new segment of students to quickly come and work in the hospital because the parents would not allow and so on but with the existing uh, staff and existing people we did a lot of these online trainings we got the modules you know wherever the modules were published and and one thing which i uh, mentioned to some of my friends earlier that we had no shame in copying from if it was from italy we would copy from italy if the government said something we just do it we it doesn't matter because what everybody was doing was for the benefit of the patient so we were just learning the modules implementing it online offline the biggest challenge was that you know there is a there is a social divide between digital haves and digital have nots so many people in the hospital environment who are in the lower grades do not have access to that digital uh, media like how we have so we made we made opportunities for them to learn through the digital media you know we sometimes we would have a combined zoom session where department head would have a zoom and you know other people will follow and things like that so you know you had to do things in a 
in a very creative manner but we uh, did that and and like for example hssc they um, they they had done run a covid management program for uh, i think it was for, for for many hours i can't remember exactly how many hours it was so they had done that so some of our people went to that and learned from that and come came back and implemented that in our uh, in our hospital but i but that's probably how we managed so uh, my my next question is to you dr nambiar uh, you are the executive director of um, gym care hospitals and uh, my question to you is pretty similar as a medical administrator what were the challenges that you faced du during the covid times and what are and also what are the challenges that you face in the non covid times especially because your hospital is in kerala how is it that you uh, you know get uh, recruitment done get competent staff and competent uh, doctors um, at your hospital can you throw some light on that thank you rasika uh, i must uh, just give you a brief introduction of this hospital so this hospital opened in the last week of february and within a month of opening was hit by a shutdown because of covid having said that uh, i must tell you the challenges that we faced in recruitments here this hospital this town is uh, this hospital is in a tier 3 city called kannur in kerala in north kerala and uh, having been you know in the larger cities till now wherever i worked has been in chennai bangalore delhi and mumbai this was the first time i have worked in a three, tier 3 town in india the challenges here had been enormous so and it is also for the highly skilled uh doctor workforce because i had to convince people that you can come and work in a hospital in a tier 3 town and there are of course you know a lot of uh, uh, people have apprehensions and this is despite the fact that this town has an international airport okay so with all that people were very you know it it took a lot of convincing but more importantly what i want you to understand is the challenge of having to recruit appropriately skilled nurses now you would find it very crazy that you know kerala produces nurses the number of nursing colleges is in kannur itself is quite a lot having said that the nurses for the same say uh, same salary or even for a larger salary than what they would get at hinduja or kokila ben were not ready to come and work in their own hometown because they look at kokila ben as a conduit to going to dubai for the next year after one year they don't think of that as as a you know as a possibility to jump from here after one year so so that was a that was a big challenge and it still continues to be a challenge uh, covid actually has improved that situation for me because many of the people who came back after you know there was an outbreak of covid uh, because bombay suffered that outbreak in the hospitals much earlier than they did in kerala so a lot of these people came back and some of them are actually now working with us but that i know is only till the time that uh, you know things get better and they can go abroad as quickly as they can in all hospitals that i've seen other than doctors and nurses every other level of uh, worker in the hospital has been a challenge and this place is no different this place was never used to seeing a hospital of the kinds i mean this is a super speciality hospital on the likes of hinduja or columbia asia or kokla ben that is the kind of hospital that we've made here so obviously we do not have the people who can work in front office with the same panache as i was to say and the skill and the understanding and empathy that you can get a staff in bombay or delhi here you don't get that so you have to we have to take them we are training them and it requires a lot of training of that level of people here the people uh, who come as cleaners to the hospitals are used to working in hospitals that are at a very very different level so to make them understand the principles of infection control you know all that training is required and 
Unfortunately, such skills are not available as trained skill workers in the industry. So that has been a challenge. Um, right. In yeah, so that is that is what I would say that it, you know everywhere it's a challenge in the country. Every city looks at it has a different challenge of its own. All right. So tell us about your initiatives at your hospital uh, for uh, you know all levels of healthcare workers that you have deployed into for training. So uh, let me tell you. Yeah. So when we started, because we saw all these challenges, uh, we have uh, like this hospital is a completely digitized hospital. So I had to start with training in computer science to everybody. We trained people in informatics. We took a lot of this staff almost six to eight months before our due uh, opening date so that we could train them. Uh, we trained people on the basics based on the NABH criteria on the policies because people here are not used to making SOPs and following policies. So we started training everybody six to eight months before we actually started the hospital. So that is one of the decisions that we took and gradually taking you know 20 people at a time training them and then putting in them on the job so they undergo a training of almost 10 to 15 days everybody before they are put on the job and at a lot of skills uh, we are like even i contribute contribute to training people on greeting and how do you talk to the patients everybody who's you know there are about 10 or people who have who are at senior levels, mid to senior levels, and who worked in hospitals uh, in Bombay, Delhi, and you know various corporate hospitals, who understand the kind of training that we need to give, and we all contribute to that training. I mean, which may even involve telling the housekeeping person how to do, use a you know mechanized flow scrubber. Starts from that level, and goes up to and and we have done that, and we and people are using it. And uh, so that is, it is a challenge, yes, but then I have a team that understands that if we don't do it, we will never get there. So therefore, we are, that's how we started. All right. So is yeah. there like a sustainable program in place at your hospital that when you say that you've gotten a team together, are there, are there uh, you know, is there, is there anything that we can follow in terms of a sustainable program? Um, I hope that these training programs are sustainable because many times what I have seen in other hospitals and I've seen that uh, I remember when I was at Raheja, you know, many of these training programs, they become individual driven. And uh, it is all right as long as I have the senior management team that understands that this is a requirement and we can continue. My fear is that let's say a year or two years down the line, I'm not here. And my successor does not feel the need to continue some of these training programs. Then it will go down the drain. This happens in many institutions. And I'm not saying this because it is me or any, anybody else in my place. It would be the same. So these are some of the fears that we have because this is not a structured training program. It doesn't it is not a curriculum that is designed. It is not institutionalized. So there what we need to really do is institutionalize training programs that can sustain and that can be part of you know in in partnership with an institution if these training programs were to happen and probably we, this will become a sustainable training program that you make it a routine that this training will be done by everybody but that is uh, since that is not there the owners of continuing this at the moment is on the senior team that is here but how much it will be sustainable as an individual organization, I'm not so sure that these are long term sustainable pro programs because the priorities change, the priorities of the management will change and uh, it will fall by the wayside sooner than later. I mean, I see that, you know, in a year's time, I don't think that I will have the kind of time that I have today to teach every guest relation person to teach them how to stand in the lobby and greet a patient. So when that happens, this will, you know, take a beating. Right now, your programs are people specific. And so do you see yourself moving to technology 
and an inclusion of technology to make these programs much more standardized, much more uh, institutionalized, as you said? Yes, so here uh, we have a subscription to uh, WebEx as well as Microsoft Teams and all my staff uh, knows how to be part of these online training programs. I do videos and I post them and they watch it on their smartphones and we do once a month at least, uh, you know, online training program because of uh, COVID we don't use any classroom teaching at all. So every uh, station and most of these videos that I post is usually uh, and also the online classes I take is after working hours so they can take their classes from home after they've made their dinner, after they've had their dinner and they can watch it on phone. So this is the this is what we are doing. We do not have classroom teaching unless it is in very small numbers and specific demonstration of an equipment that has to be used. And that is in small numbers of two to three people at a time. And this okay. has been since the time we started the hospital. And uh, what kind of skills are being taught online? I mean, is it a, is it the entire gamut that is being taught online or is there a specific uh, uh, skill that you are essentially moving online? So right now for every department, we have got training modules which are online. So we do what okay. is required, what can be done online in terms of instructions, instead of teaching them about policies, instead of telling them about how to measure quality in their departments and so on and so forth. But there is a lot of physical training that is required, which we spread it out because you can't really do cluster based training right now. So you can't have clusters of people. So we do that. OK, so we have taken uh, these subscriptions much before because I'm very, you know, technology focused and I have always felt that we should yeah. be using technology to the best ability and it was planned as a paperless hospital with all these subscriptions. It just came in very handy. OK. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in a way, COVID was a driver for moving, moving you to this entire platform very rapidly. So if you can see that there is a good, bad and ugly to COVID, um, we had more good than ugly. Because okay. we hadn't started the hospital, we didn't have so many patients. It's only now that we have started getting COVID patients because of the change in the government policy to allow the private patient, private hospitals to take COVID patients. But for the first three months, it was only the good. Yeah, all right. Thank I you so much. Technology. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nambiar. I Thanks. will uh, now move to uh, um, Mr. Puneet Kohli. Uh, Mr. Kohli, you are a new entity on this platform and coming up with new skills, maybe in terms of uh, manufacturing skills or maybe in with uh, skills that are related to your medical devices being used by P uh, by healthcare workers. So it's a, it's a new need and a new capacity building that we would like to uh, take care of. So what are your views about how do we ramp up for your for your medical technology sector? And, uh, you know, you have a great experience in terms of resilience there globally. What are those uh, uh, learning lessons or any building blocks that we could take from resilience medical care that uh, that can allow us to have, uh, you know, some important strategies in place? Sure, Dr. Asika. First of all, it was great to hear uh, Gautam and Dr. Uma talk about you know, how the healthcare system surmounted the challenge. So uh, we also faced some sort in our clinics, which I'll tell you during the course. So at the outset, Dr. Asika, I think uh, you know COVID has really highlighted this huge need for skilling and upskilling. Uh, and you know, as we all know, this topic has been in discussion for a long time. And I'm glad that, you know, uh, we are discussing it now and hopefully we can, you know, take some action points from this uh, discussion. So before I dwell into, you know, your uh, question and try to sure. answer it, it will be good to tell you something about uh, Fresenius Medical Care. Uh, who we are, what we do, uh, because it is essential as FMC has done a lot of work globally on skilling of uh, the dialysis workers. 
so fmc is the only medtech company as far as you know i see who has forward integrated so we are actually from a technology company transition to a global dialysis service provider uh, which uh, is is very different than what medtech companies do we are part of a global fresenius group uh, which has interest apart from dialysis in clinical nutrition in infusion in hospital management and consulting with over 100 years uh, Uh, history of taking care of patients so coming to fresenius medical care uh, you know you uh, you will see these staggering numbers we have 45 manufacturing bases across the globe in our clinics which are more than 4000 we treat 340000 patients as a global dialysis player we perform 50 million dialysis treatments in our network which is close to 0.6 uh, second fmc does a dialysis somewhere in the globe we have 125000 employees globally and bulk of these employees are technicians nurses and the engineers who take care of our machine installed base from a technology angle we we call it tap to patient uh, you know we have right from a water treatment unit to filters dialyzers machines and we have approximately 50% market share globally of installed dialysis machines so with this as a you know global experience we can certainly help uh, you know the need for dialysis manpower in india and also we can draw lessons from our own covid experience i am not saying you know our scale is very different in india we run 40 clinics uh, and treat about 2000 plus patients but there are a lot of lessons which we learned uh, globally on how to manage remote training how to manage clinical data management remotely and i'll talk about this now uh, you know it is well established you know that the the need for uh, allied health professionals paramedical staff we were talking you know on the numbers and i i got hold of one of the papers which said that uh, we will need 6.4 million allied healthcare professionals and i think uh, government has done a lot of work uh, in, in this regard you know given uh, uh, our lifespan is is increasing in our country uh, which will mean that patients will have more longevity with several comorbid conditions which will mean healthcare workers job will change because they will have to take care of the patients at the community level and also you know with the launch of national Di- digital health mission our healthcare workers have to really upskill themselves when it when it comes to adoption of technology and also you know ayushman bharat with this focus of universal healthcare i think we will see a boom in uh, in 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 healthcare in india which involves a, a multidisciplinary team based approach to healthcare uh, so i think it is quite evident that we need a lot of you know allied healthcare professionals i'll give you statistics on dialysis which we are pretty sure because we deal only in dialysis so only 10% hospitals in india do dialysis which is about 4500 approximately 45000 machines dialysis machines and in india we have uh, a mandated one man power for every three machines so roughly we have 15000 uh, dialysis technicians stroke nurses now you look at the problem the end stage renal disease patients in india are 2.4 million and only 250000 are on dialysis right and every year we are adding 200000 more patients which will mean that in next decade we will need 10 times the dialysis machines and correspondingly we'll need close to 200000 dialysis technicians in india you know again these are very conservative numbers these are not very uh, you know very very aggressive numbers 
Now, certainly you asked about the FMC global experience. Uh, we have really mastered this art wherever we went in countries wherein resource capacity was a constraint. We build the manpower for dialysis. For taking care of the patient and also the engineers to manage the post service of these machines. Now, very uniquely uh, to train the dialysis technicians uh, in 2006 FMC started a Fresenius Institute of Dialysis Nursing, which we call as FIDN. Now this is a benchmark intervention to develop dialysis nurse. This course is endorsed by European Dialysis Nursing Association and also European Renal Care Association. So it has the global stamp to it. It has got a highly commended rating, which means that uh, we have a very extremely well developed program, which is through a sound, sound curriculum and a very clear approach to preparing students to take care of live clinical solutions. So I'll again, you know, give you very specific examples on how FIDN can be tailor made to Indian requirement. We, we, we know that in India, uh, Gautam and Dr. Uma will know that in India dialysis is not done by nurses. It is most by technicians. So can we look at a entry level dialysis care technologist program taking 12th science students, putting them under 12 months of rigorous virtual. Now it will be virtual training along with one year internship. So that can be the entry level course to build this capacity in India. We already have you know, many dialysis technicians who need upskilling. So can we start a contemporary dialysis nurse program wherein we can take uh, a BSc nursing, a fresher or with a one year experience, put them under six months internship and bring them up to speed and up to an international level. Also, uh, you know, apart from the dialysis nurse and technicians, we all know uh, doctors is a huge uh, constraint in India and also in the renal space. We have less than 2000 nephrologists and we don't have uh, physicians taking care of dialysis centers in tier two, tier three geographies. A dialysis center is managed by technicians, so we need to have a physician training program. Can we look at putting MBBS under six months to nine months course to make them dialysis specialists so that they can clinically manage these clinics? So these are certain examples on how we can use our global experience to make courses fit for India. Uh, the second aspect to it, uh, Rasika, is on the engineers. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of machine globally. Wherever we have gone, we have created advanced courses in tie up with engineering colleges to run apprenticeship programs to groom young engineers, which we then absorb within FMC. As we speak today, we have more than 250 engineers on our own role. So probably within the medtech uh, space, we have the largest engineer base with us. So, you know, these are certain examples which I wanted to share wherein, you know, FMC can really add value and bring a lot of uh, change to our uh, dialysis technician skilling and upskilling needs. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. What emerges is that, you know, we, you at Fresenius have created an entire network and an entire ecosystem to support that. Uh, and that can be a lo good learning lesson for us to, to kind of build on. Right. The other question that I wanted to ask you is for the quick ramp up during COVID or non-COVID times. Did you have, uh, you know, any technology directly used with uh, your um, uh, with uh, your uh, allied health force or with the nurses that are there? Yeah, so, you know, Rasika, as, as Gautam started that when the lockdown happened, uh, you know, everyone was caught by surprise. So, you know, initially three days were challenging because our engineers were not able to troubleshoot the machines. 
our nurses technicians were not able to go to the hospital but then you know as gautam mentioned hospitals came in and you know got the nurses technicians to our clinics uh, what we did was uh, you know from a machine troubleshooting and installation basis we created online courses so that technicians can learn how to troubleshoot minor repair through their own as well as you know install the machine themselves of course in, in many cases our engineers had to go and then government gave passes but as we are speaking uh, rasika at a global level we are now trying to develop 3d intuitive models which can be used to remotely uh, troubleshoot as well as train the technicians on machine usage and installation and there are several examples i think um, in the surgical space a lot of medtech companies have you know taken remote tools to virtually train surgeons on surgical techniques and on new technology uh, also uh, rasika what we did and where the expertise of fmc came into play is to how a doctor can remotely manage in a covid type lockdown condition how the dialysis clinic is functioning and therein we have our proprietary clinical data management system which we call as euclid uh, you know dr uma was mentioning about you know the paperless hospital our endeavor is to make a paperless dialysis clinic and euclid comes in handy it uh, takes anonymous collection and evaluation of quality parameters in a dialysis center which can be used to improve patient outcome it also helps a dialysis doctor a nephrologist to remotely see what is happening from a clinical angle inside the uh, the dialysis clinic and through this as you saw we do 50 million plus treatments globally we are working through euclid to come out with ai tools predictive and analytics to create a patient model which can enhance the outcome reduce the hospitalization rate and that is where you know fmc is very proud that you know we can add tremendous value to the clinical uh, management of a patient also uh, you know we are working that you know if covid type situation happens how we can do our quality audits remotely which which also is very important because uh, you know you have to consistently you know keep on reskilling the staff and quality audits are uh, the backbone for the training programs so these are certain examples of use of technology uh, dr rasika which covid really helped us you know hasten the process uh thank you so much uh, i shall we shall come back to your uh, model a little later and i'll discuss that with uh, gautam also we yeah. now uh, would like to ask our uh, supply uh, head over here at this in this particular panel dr rajiv about uh, now that we've heard about problems at the hospital space we've heard about all the challenges that were there during the covid time uh how far how large do you think this manpower gap is what are the initiatives being done by your organizations and biases to kind of uh, you know minimize this gap what are your thoughts about uh, steps that need to be taken at the medical college levels do you think that you know in some way the medical students uh, should have been included into this particular covid war Uh, as it would have been a great experience and valuable experience for them to uh, to you know understand how to deal with a pandemic situation so um your thoughts on all of uh, all of this asika uh, and uh, co panelists because first of all asika for having organized this a uh, session and uh, addressing this burning issue and my co panelists uh, for having enlightened me on different uh, stakeholder perceptions as you said two are from the uh, requirement front two are from the service industry one is from dealing with the policy matters it makes good sense to hear stakeholder perceptions from diverse uh, echelons 
plus to have a 360 degree perception and understanding of the program and the uh, 360 degree evaluation of the issues at hand. Uh, having said this, uh, your first question was, there is a demand supply gap. And obviously in every aspect and every dimension of the healthcare sector, whether it's doctors, nurses, paramedics, allied healthcare professionals, the gaps is phenomenal, are phenomenal. One is if you require the number of doctors, last count which I heard despite the 500 plus medical colleges, and I don't know whether another medical college has been established yesterday because as I speak today, as of now, there are close to about 540 medical colleges and every day the count is changing. The number of nursing colleges, the number of allied healthcare professional training institutes. But whereas we focus on the doctors and the nurses who happen to be the main fulcrum of the healthcare delivery, please do not forget that whereas there are a dime and dozen medical colleges, nursing colleges who are governed by the fiefdom, and I use the word with a strong connotation of fiefdom of regulatory bodies, whether it's the Indian Nursing Council, the State Nursing Council, the National Medical Commission, in place in the erstwhile Medical Council of India, these two happen to be in the forefront and in the spotlight. But as we always say that the healthcare sector is not unorganized, it is disorganized. The reason why we say so and that it is disorganized is because a large chunk of requirement is in the allied healthcare profession, by which I mean the technologists, the nurse, uh, the, the, the paramedics. Simply speaking, the word paramedic is not defined in our constitution. Unlike in the West, there is a definition, role and responsibility and job which can be undertaken by a paramedic. Nowhere in the Indian medical schedule do you find the word paramedic defined. That is the unfortunate state of affairs. And therefore, symbiosis took an inverted pyramidal approach to addressing this shortage of doctors and nurses. What do I mean by this inverted pyramid? Rather than going to the favorite of doctors and nurses and setting up a med school and a nursing school early on, which we, as a brand, Symbiosis could have easily launched a med school. We thought of addressing and targeting the manpower requirement at the base of the pyramid. And what do I mean by the base of the pyramid? It is the allied healthcare professionals. And in allied healthcare professionals, I essentially speak of the technologists, understanding that the rapidity with which technology is impacting healthcare delivery, we cannot and we should not expect the clinicians to understand the technologies which are used for supporting healthcare delivery. Let them focus on their core competency of giving clinical care. Let the technologists be utilized for adapting and making available this advanced technology for the betterment of healthcare delivery and therefore the betterment of healthcare outcome. And understanding that the technological requirements of a dialysis technician are different from what are required by the imaging technician, are required from the OT and anesthesia, are different from what are required in the respiratory area, are different from what are required in the OT and anesthesia, are different from what are required in the ophthalm area, or for that matter, neurotechnology. We have started with the basic condition that let's give them the pride of job. Let us replace the word technician by technologist. Technician is the one who over the yester years was clean grown, homebred, and gradually upgraded himself from a person who was in shorts doing the various odd jobs, including the domestic code of the doctor and the nurses, to someone who starts understanding how an X-ray is taken, to someone who starts understanding how the film or the plate is it is taken, someone who starts understanding how the cannulation is done, so on and so forth, but have a structured three-year, nothing short of a three-year degree program, which we nomenclature as BSc in medical technology, going on to give a career progression in the chosen discipline of technology into an MSc program. So that this cadre of technologists, whether it's a BSc or an MSc, dialysis technologists, respiratory care technologists, imaging technologists, who gets to learn the basics of technology right from fluoroscopy to X-ray to ultrasound to CT to MRI to PC uh, to position PT, so on and so forth, he gradually learns 
the nose and butt and how it emits. And an important part of this training is the foundation program which we implement, in which he learns the basis or the basics and fundamentals of medical sciences, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and so forth, much as what a medico learns, but toned down to what is expected of him as a technologist and not as a primary healthcare provider. He also learns the dynamics of working in a team because unfortunately, we healthcare providers or we doctors, and I say this with utmost disdain in all my fora, that we work in silos, we work in ivory towers. As regards team work, medicos are not taught in their formative years to work in teams. And we choose to be in our own designed islands of excellence. Interprofessional practice, ethical aspects, legal aspects, learning the basics of first aid, because a dialysis technologist may at times unfortunately be required to create an anaphylactic shock, or while doing an angiography, uh, imaging technologists would be required to face and manage, along with his team, support the management of anaphylactic shock. How does he brace up to these requirements? So these are some things which we inbuilt in the curriculum before the technologist chooses to, to take, pick up one of these specializations. Likewise, we have an abundant number of good clinicians. We have an abundant number of good nurses, very competent nurses, and thanks to Uma, who turns out the nurses from the hinterland and the fountain of nursery, nursing care, Kerala. But are we as doctors ever trained in our medical education curriculum to run our and manage our healthcare services as a business. And when I say business, I do not connote the commercial content, but the professionalism which goes in delivering healthcare services. We are not taught strategic management. We are not taught finance management. We are not taught man management. We are not taught healthcare communication. And all these are essential ingredients of effective and important healthcare delivery. The basics of healthcare communication, which is the first scene of mitigation, which a patient sold, is shown in the mind of patient, starts off with poor litigation, the poor communication skills. And we clinicians blissfully believe and has, has been brought down to us by generations of population as demigods. We don't need to talk to our patients as much as we, the patient would like to teach us. So this is where the symbiosis model has been fundamental different. We have indulged in a lot of skill-based and simulation-based learning. We are amongst the first universities in the country to set up a dedicated one lakh square feet facility for skill-based uh, education. In fact, the Symbiosis Center for Skill uh, and Simulation is uh, closely associating with the Health Sector Skill Council. We've tied up with global agencies which work in simulation. So. This is where we've, ta we, we've uh, uh, collaborated with global organizations, whether the American Heart Association, the International Trauma Life Support Organization, the American Trauma Life Support Organization, many such organizations, and in testimony to the fact of the good work that Symbiosis has been doing, the Symbiosis Center for Health Skills specifically, the American Heart Association has conferred upon us the gold award for last three years in succession. Because they believe in the continuity, the rigor, the, the conformance to international program guidelines, and the outcomes of having trained over a lakh healthcare providers in basic first aid. In fact, in the prestigious Maharashtra Emergency Medical Services, all the zonal leaders, all the zonal leaders have been alumni of the Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences and now the Symbiosis Center for Health Skills. So, so much so about symbiosis and the fact that our focus and energy is on the allied healthcare professionals, whether it's the technologists, whether it's the nutrition and dietitians, which, because finally we are all what we eat, was the old saying, and therefore we believe on training this cadre of um, uh, nutrition and dietists and not focusing on what they have been conventionally taught, but training them on newer areas, such as nutrigenomics, public health nutrition which has exposed the deficiency in Latini and also the fact that clinical engineers, which uh, 
when Mr. Kohli spoke about bringing a generation of engineers who are taught medicine and medicos who are taught engineering. So it's cleaning years, so as to say, to get the best blend of addressing the felt need of clinicians who can adopt the technology. And that's what I shall be coming to when we talk about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the opportunities it has forced us to adopt. So this is what uh, I would, would like to say about the symbiosis approach. But more importantly, I would like to address the coronavirus and how it has you know, thrown us into the deep ocean much ahead of time. We all talk about adopting technology, but we are always, um, you know, loath, reluctant, and at times resistant as healthcare professionals to adopt technology. And when we say healthcare, I would like to differentiate between medical and nursing on one side and allied healthcare professionals on the other side. Within the medical and nursing, there is a difference between the, uh, the, the service sector and the ed uh, education part. And within the education part, there's a difference between imparting clinical education or education in the preclinical subjects versus clinical subjects. And having said this, the corona, as Dr. Muzundar, our founder chancellor, always says, rightly addressed by some as a big destroyer, but as Uma has said, it has given us much more than we have lost out to corona. It has been a great teacher. And time and again, it has taught us and has exposed a fractured public health care infrastructure. And it has brought to the forefront and the limelight the necessity of investing in teaching, 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 training, retraining, and retraining, and raising a cadre of healthcare professionals for the benefit of the common man. So, yeah, can I continue? So you, yes, sure, sure. So uh, this is something which the corona has taught us. And as Gautam has rightly said, there should be, we should not feel shy of learning from other people's experiences, avoiding to make those mistakes which they possibly have done, and understanding the need for adoption and transition. And going back, again, drawing an analogy to industry and technology, we had the, in, uh, uh, the version four, which talked about, about adoption of technology in the industry and in the you know, manufacturing sector. And we now have version five, which talks about adding the human element. And as Kavan, as the Kohli would rightly say, uh, uh, endorse, it is the man behind the machine, which is more or who is more, if not equally important. And getting this 21st century attribute of adaptive agility, or a synergistic collaboration is something which we have tried to forge and inculcate in the training of our healthcare professionals. In fact, that goes in the training of all students at the Symbiosis International University. So broadly speaking, we understand that we need to be aware of the challenges and we are aware, we've anticipated the opportunity, the challenges which the corona is going to throw as regarding imparting education, not only in the healthcare sector, but the faculty of health sciences, which I represent, but across the eight faculties, whether it's engineering, whether it's management, whether it's law. And we understand that it's a period of unknown unknowns. We don't know. And as someone very likely said, even God does not know when the corona is going to change or when it is going to improve. When you ask God, he says, go ask the devil. God, when is the corona going to change? So it's, it's a school, it's a time where before one can get back to normal. And what's going to be the new normal? Well, besides wearing masks and avoiding handshaking and going back to our traditional age-old namaste, avoiding, uh, I mean, maintaining social distancing, everything is there. We have believed in first and foremost, ensuring the safety of all stakeholders, whether it's the staff, whether it's the students, whether it's the vendors who come to the campus, whether it's the administrator, because that's something very important. Because students at this point of time are a confused lot. As Gautam rightly said, right from the time they got their first patient till the time now, there is continuous flooding of advisories, um, uh, uh, guidelines, mandates, and uh, Gautam is probably fortunate that he gets them only from the Ministry of Health, whereas we get it from the Ministry of Health, we get it from the Ministry of Education, and so many self-appointed 
moral regulators of education and healthcare delivery that we have to satisfy to the best of our ability all people who give these mandates or fatwas and see what best can be done there has to be addressal of all stakeholders concerns especially the students anxiety is run high students have concerns of academic academic delivery finances these are a major problem in today's world students are faced with the dire difficulty of funding their education especially the ones who come with home with educational loan we need we, we have maintained a very clear cut ongoing policy of ensuring a seamless communication with our, our stakeholders we have demarcated healthcare education from clinical versus paraclinic uh, pre clinical and healthcare versus non healthcare as i said and the deployment of technology is the common denominator across all disciplines so whether you have online learning virtual classrooms dr google uh, cisco webex the uh, ever popular zoom flip classrooms uh, chatbots web webcast recorded pre uh, live uh, video online chat sessions you name them there are million of such online portals of education the fundamental challenge is are two things one do we have the faculty trained for adopting this and one of my colleagues from the faculty of media and communication she did a workshop for us and she said rajiv all what i want to do is to train you all guys to be camera ready and just in the beginning of this session you saw how each one of us try to look our best presentable face and because we healthcare professionals are so you know appearance uh, indifferent to our appearance we believe that our our competency lies in delivering a healthcare rather than looking or appearing good alone which is equally important in this world of showbiz but uh, that's important that we have to have faculty in place <laughs> and more importantly we need to have the students being able to adopt this technology and students are uh, being the millennials they are very tech savvy it is the faculty who needs to adopt this tech technology and technology at a very rapid rate we need to have innovative strategies for teaching learning and assessment and important uh, attributes from gautam right to said the world over graduate medical education in the us talks about uh, interestable professional activities we have got the cbtv clinical competency based uh, technology variable or time variable models many such models which are being developed we have to adopt them the sooner we do them the better it is and finally we have to be future ready all this is not going to be a passing phase the technology is a permanent inviting it's going to be replacing and impacting all our functioning whether as healthcare service providers or educationists here to stay and we can't say that we'll do it for the next few months and forget about it virtual learning virtual reality applied artificial intelligence all probably fancy words today unfortunately but they are going to have their footprint and a very strong impact in years to come the next generation of healthcare you. providers will have to be a digitally qualified healthcare professional either in academics or in the service thank you for giving me a chance Thank. And I believe I overshot my time, but there's so much to say in such a short you. time. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for covering the entire spectrum, actually, uh, of uh, health education in terms of clinical and non-clinical. I'm sure there there are a lot of takeaways from your uh, from your uh, discussion. Uh, with these takeaways, I'd like to ask uh, um, uh, Gautam that uh, from the Uh, points that uh, Dr. Rajiv just spoke about. Uh, is there a model that can evolve for hospitals that can be replicated in a very simple way uh, for you know skilling and capacity building uh, at at various hospitals? Because we look at your hospital as a role model, probably. And that's why this question. So, Rasika, thank you. Actually, uh, Dr. Rajiv. Give wonderful ideas, and I'm going to uh, talk about what he said, what uh, Puneet said, and what Dr. Uma said. Also, you know, uh, one of the things which emerged in this crisis is that all of us, uh, depending on 
irrespective of where we were in the ecosystem, we were all working together. And this ecosystem worked to ensure a good patient care. I mean, for example, like Puneet mentioned, his people were doing the training and you know so on and on. And I think the, the need of the hour is that the gap in the requirement is so huge that it cannot be done by any one person alone. It cannot be done by physical people, it, uh, physical methods. It cannot be done by digital delivery. It has to be combination of each and everything. And you know, this, for example, a simulation center. Now, Fresenius talks about, I mean, he talked about that they are doing the training for the people, but the technician and the nurses who are trained there, they actually also need to learn in real settings. And in real settings, you don't have enough hospitals doing the training. So, you know, it's, it's a chicken and egg kind of situation. So you need to have simulation centers and maybe the government can, you know, uh, recognize the need and this is one of the things that the government can do is to set up government simulation centers where people can learn and then you know and and people like us hospitals and like dr nambiar's hospital we need to recognize this and 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 recruit them so because unless we recruit them people are not going to get trained and i think that is where one of the issues is he, he dr rajiv talked about the number of medical colleges and number of nursing colleges. The, the problem in, in, uh, in that is that the number of colleges are huge, but the number of people applying to those colleges is decreasing every day and Dr. Uma would certify this. So that is a issue. And the issue is why, although I am giving them the opportunity, why nurses are not, why girls are not, or no, I should not say girls, students are not applying to become a nurse. It is because of the available opportunity in the hospitals uh, in India and the working conditions. So that I think skill along with what they can get for future needs to be uh, managed. That, that is one aspect. Second aspect is that when we are talking about training, we are talking about only one, you know, we, 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 we talk about nurses, we talk about doctors. Now we are talking about paramedical. We are still not talking about the assistants, the attendants who are very crucial to a hospital. A hospital cannot run without an attendant. So, for example, can we make paramedical or allied health services as a professional category? Like how we have nurses, can we have that as a category? So when we have a category, then people will aspire to build a career in that. Similarly, as a hospital attendant, can we do it like an you know, hospital attendant category. So people know that there is something different required to be an attendant and it is a career. And the other thing which I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, Dr. Rajiv mentioned about something which struck a chord because I have realized this, that the, the importance of teamwork. And it is correct what he said, that the medical professionals, the clinicians, they are trained to be individual performers and everyone is trained to be an individual performer, but in a healthcare delivery, everyone has to work as a team. So I think it is incumbent on people like us to start developing them into teams and growing, you know, and, and working with different partners. Like for example, it, it is, why don't I work with Symbiosis and Fresenius and, and you know, Dr. Nambiar's hospital, Gem, Gem, Gem Care, I think you said. So they are, you know, why can't we work as an ecosystem to yeah. train everybody and develop this uh, aspect? So I think I'm just going to stop here for. Yeah, any other. sure. Uh, with that thought uh, of evolving an ecosystem, um, Dr. Nampiyar, what are your thoughts? How can this ecosystem be developed uh, in the current context where, you know, healthcare would be slightly changed with yeah, AI kind of tools coming in, telemedicine coming in. How do you suppose that, you know, with automation coming in, how do you suppose that we should create this kind of an ecosystem uh, yeah, for the same? I, so I really, there is a lot of takeaway from what uh, Dr. Rajiv has uh, mentioned and uh, what Gautam and Puneet has been saying. One thing clearly emerges is that we have a shortage of skilled manpower, undoubtedly. And uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar here with the phrase that, oh, I am looking for people and I'm not getting the right people. 
at the same time the market is flooded with people who have some skill some education but they are not really the right fit so there is a gap there of creating the skill levels uh, for what is required by the industry so i think there is a mismatch there the other thing is like uh, what um, gautam just mentioned you know of uh, optimizing skills and giving them the respect and dignity and uh, also a terminology so i'll give you an example the housekeeping professionals in my hospital i do i take some people and i train them specifically with infection control related measures and i have created a carter called infection control assistants they are not looked down upon as a housekeeping person who mops the floor so they have understanding of what is their role in preventing infections or the hospital acquired infection or cross infection in a hospital how do they change the urine bags how do they ensure that they wash hands before they touch a patient so when you do that and the, this is a totally different carder that i created now it's not a it's not a recognized designation by any where but i think we need to start doing certain optimization of skill levels we have to start thinking out of the box why is it that a nurse is required to make the bed nurse should be utilized in doing what is core nursing job why cannot we look at you know this skewed ratio definitions that we need to keep why is it that we need to have a one is to one nurse to a patient or one is to three nurse to a patient ratios why cannot we replace that one nurse with one nurse and two assistants that will help or you know define skills in a manner that you don't waste a very trained resource person who gets frustrated having to make a bed or you know having to feed a patient while as she or he should be uh, doing hardcore nursing job and transportation of a patient could be handled by somebody else who's trained how to transport a patient so i think it's necessary for us to recognize that we need to start training and building skill levels in the areas of our requirement patient transportation is an important job you know taking care of the hygiene of a patient is an important job it doesn't require a nurse to do it similarly why is it that a doctor has to spend so much time in documentation whereas a physician assistant can do of course physician assistants nowadays people have started doing but we can give a nurse or somebody else that uh, career progression to a physical a physician assistant where the nurse can look forward to you know a uh, bridge career in a, as a physician assistant when they are sufficiently senior because they understand medicine you know as much or more than a junior doctor so similar to like what uh, pani said you know in, why do you need to have a dm nephrology doing dialysis whereas you can have an mbbs trained do, mbbs doctor who can be trained with a few months of training into the appropriate dialysis dialysis related features i mean that's all that you require so we need to really start looking at what is optimal skilling of an individual start looking at creating you know reducing the non core job for an highly skilled person and create intermediate skills give them designations and i don't and you know it's it's concerning that you know we have uh, what dr rajiv was saying that there is no category like that defined by the government i think we need to look at how we need to work despite whatever the lacunas are the government has let's start recognizing the need to uh, designate certain skills create certain designations so that people can work with respect in those cadres i think that's very important and i think create those appropriate skill levels which are required at the lower levels no point having a good transplant surgeon if your housekeeping person is not washing hands before touching their patient absolutely thank you yes. so much for throwing light on that uh, 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 punit uh, i would like to ask you sir that what do you see as the role of the government in creating an institution of this format or creating this ecosystem of this format for your industry so again very important points were made by dr rajiv Absolutely. gautam and dr uma i think i just want to pick up he mentioned this freedom i think 
if covid cannot break these fiefdoms i don't know when they will be whatever you know he was referring to i think that clinging on to power and you know not letting experts come in uh, and and i think we are all moving in the right direction government has taken a lot of measures i think uh, during covid the way we uh, ramped up our ppe face masks ventilators then the government also announced this uh, self reliant program uh, which is again very ambitious and medical devices are part of that as a focus area and uh, if it happens the way it is envisaged uh, then you know we have problem at hand because you will create infrastructure or manufacturing but you know where is that ecosystem to you know manage that flow of uh, workers which will come so like the government has announced the pli schemes medical device parks i think there should be a parallel focus on how to develop skilled manpower ecosystem around the manufacturing units and it should be on a mission mode you know like you know lot of things this government puts on mission mode this should be on mission mode because many of the medtech companies are averse to setting up manufacturing because there is a lack of availability of skilled manpower at the plants especially from a medical device uh, perspective and i think again uh, you know gautam mentioned about teamwork dr rajiv mentioned about teamwork i think we have to create consortium here even in this regard you can have academic institution government bodies medtech companies who will you know come in to create you know these clusters in in states because you know each state is developing their own uh, medical device parks and similar initiative should be on the r&d part because if medical device manufacturing has to get, gather steam we have to look at high tech manufacturing and you know many medtech companies have captive r&d units in india and why can't the government uh, you know partner with them and of course we we should have very strong intellectual property right framework because multinationals are quite wary on you know the the intellectual property rights uh, so so here again i think for me uh, having seen uh, you know the medical device space and there are several examples uh, dr sika uh, medtech companies training surgeons on laparoscopic surgery companies training uh, phlebotomists on how to use a vacuum cleaner we also have a connect program of training dialysis technicians on how to uh, you know do different therapies on different machines uh, and of course covid has made medtech companies realize we need to have you know virtual models now i want to give very specific 10 point things how to involve or create a ecosystem team work on how we can and i am just making an attempt it is it is just a thought of course it it should be refined first and foremost i think the recognition should come that private sector can add lot of value in skill development and we should be welcomed with open arms by the policy makers and we have to identify in each therapeutic area domain the expertise like i can say fmc can be an expert in dialysis because of various thing which i spoke then how this selection should happen should be involving a association like for dialysis indian society of nephrology they should do this work of selecting who are the experts because ultimately at the heart dr rasika whether it is hinduja or jam or symbiosis or physicians or niti ayog or all india institute everybody has patients interest at the core right so we are all aligned then why this you know this confusion and each uh, stakeholder should have a role what have made a very important point on this infrastructure right now i have seen that you know when it everybody wants to do but then they say no no private side should put up institutes across india impossible because 
of various uh, factors including investment this should be the role of the government infrastructure and funding of training uh, of the uh, of the staff of course medical colleges can be involved to create that infrastructure then relevant association should endorse the program should put up quality guidelines should dedicate faculties and private sector should bring in expertise in course content specialized trainers through a fee based structure because we cannot do this through our business it should be at a arms length because of mci guidelines and now national medical commission fcpa uh, government of india should also encourage donors like rotary trust to invest in skill building because economic value created is huge when you create a skilled worker also you know every company is supposed to spend 2% of their profits on csr why can't government mandated to be spent on skill building in the area where that company is an expert like i i can't spend money on dialysis why not it is a csr because i know that subject my company can create a larger impact so these are some things which comp- which government needs to change and the objective should be you know we spoke about uh, the quality of output coming in the worker who comes to a clinic after a training should be able to handle complex issues right that is where the complaint is from hospitals when i meet they say that the quality of trainees who come are not up to the mark the eighth point is the course should be mixed you know as gautam mentioned it should be a mix of virtual lectures theoretical topics technology and enab- enablement with a 6 to 8 months of internship and those internship can happen in private institutions like hinduja or medical colleges the ninth point is very important dr rajiv mentioned about the digitization or everything will be around digital each program should have a module on the adoption of digital health you know as the national uh, digital health mission uh, the pm announced so this has to be integrated in all these interventions and last but not the least this should be in a continuum of training after a, a worker goes into the uh, active uh, clinical life there should be specific interventions throughout the professional journey of a healthcare professional yeah thank you so much for nate for building this whole uh, block for us in terms of how a private entity can move into the space of a public uh, um, uh, um, you know for public services uh since we are running out of time i just like to um have you know one last line kind of thing from all of you starting with uh, dr rajiv as a capping someone rightly said bharat mein logon ko kaam nahi hai aur bharat mein kaam ke log nahi hai that spells out the, the 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 dichotomy between the demand and the enrollment what uh, gautam said we need to understand the difference between skill development and competency building because competency is the largest um, you know set of big skill set beyond attitude motivation etc contribute and also we all need to understand and i would like to supplement what gautam said probably didn't come up clearly in my talk initially that all this non clinical virtual learning is at best a complement it can never supplement clinical hardcore hospital based practices have you said this let me make some bold statements that today's mbbs doctors are an extinct species and i say this with utmost disdain because all the mbbs doctors are either wanting to pursue their post graduation and no 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 disrespect meant to their provision but to their to their aspirations or they are trying for overseas placement or overseas examinations where are the mbbs doctor which uma wants them to conduct the dialysis they are simply not available the third thing is as regard nurses we have to give them their due we recently launched a program mba in nursing management and there were very few takers and one of the senior nurses from one of the 
senior healthcare organization, which I will not name, said that, sir, why should I enroll for this program? Because though I would get this additional two years of qualification, my salary would not go up or at the most go up by just a few hundreds. It's not worth the investment. The return on investment do not justify me to undertake these professional upgrading activities. We need to create an aspiration amongst the doctors, nurses, and other things. Amongst all cadres, I have specific national occupation standards defined as the HWAC is doing. Doctor is familiar with those NOS and everyone else. And finally, as a takeaway, if I could say one word, we all need to symbiose. Symbiose with different cadres, different sectors within the healthcare sector. And as synergistic collaboration, please look at world outside the healthcare sector. By which I mean, learn to interact and accept the proficiency and supremacy of IT professionals, the media professionals, the engineering professionals. Because we're talking about gamification as a strategy to impart education. We are talking about entertainment. We are not simply trained. We are not qualified to get the guest best products onto the table. We are not taught how to be camera ready, so we need to symbiote. That's the Thank you for coining that new word. And uh, Gautam, your takeaway, uh, just a, just a quick takeaway from for all of us. So, I mean, I've heard wonderful things from all the panelists. So, I mean, I, I'm taking a lot back uh, after this uh, program. And thank you to Nathal, thank you, Anvisha, and thank you to my uh, all the panelists. So my uh, takeaway is that firstly, uh, skilling cannot be any one person's job. It needs to be done by everybody in the ecosystem, wherever they can contribute, however. And it cannot be un understood as a short-term profit uh, opportunity. It cannot be. It is important for the long term, for the future of our country, for the future of our ecosystem. That's why everybody should contribute. Second aspect is that teamwork and respect is important. So if we start respecting everybody in the team and as, as a professional, you will suddenly find more and more people going in for that profession because it is just another profession with, treated with respect. So I think that is an urge to everybody in the healthcare industry. And the third thing for the government to an understand that private sector cannot do it alone. And there is a important need for government and private to come together, like how we came during the pandemic together, to come together and fix this uh, in, uh, the skilling gap in the country. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Bhattar. Uh, Puneet, uh, last words from you. No, I think pretty much uh, Dr. Rasika has been said. I think the the uh, if we cannot change track after this shock of COVID, in which you know I hear that many positives have come out, like Dr. Uma, Dr. Rajiv said, and I also truly believe. Uh, I think those piecemeal approaches and doing things disjointedly, and Dr. Rajiv has coined that word. I think. Uh, similar minds who have patients interest and Indian citizens interest at heart should come together. And like, you know, four of us, there are so many brilliant minds here, right? And we should create a holistic plan, which again, Gautam said it is not skilling is not a, you know, one day job or a one month or a one year. We have to create a, a multi decade program with clear milestones and clear responsibilities of each and every stakeholder. I think that will really be a big, big benefit or, you know, service which we will bring to the table as, you know, stakeholders doing our, you know, regular work. But I think it, it's our responsibility having spent and devoted our life to healthcare that we should come out with, uh, with very clear cut path. And I think I, I use that word open arms, private sec sector should be welcomed with open arms. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, um, Dr. Nambia, uh, your your thoughts on whatever has been spoken. 
So first of all, I must appreciate the initiative that Natal has taken to, to start discussing this. Now, what is very clearly emerging is that we need to, all of us need to promote the concept of having to get out of our traditional mindset and our conventional ways of thinking. Because if we don't do that, we do not respect the dignity of labor. And the and I think that uh, one of the uh, factors that is responsible for such lack of manpower in different areas is that we do not respect every father. Every person needs to be respected for the job that they do, and which is absolutely necessary and providing skill and training and uh, creating designations at that respect. Government and private organizations need to work together. It is not, and it is the designations that are that exist today in our society are the brainchild of a conventional mindset. So let us start thinking in an unconventional manner. Let's start respecting everybody and let's understand that if we all need to provide safe patient care as we all aim to do, then we all need to work to think differently and really create cadres like, you know, don't take a front office assistant from a hotel. Create somebody for the hospital. So we have to start thinking like that and uh, Obviously, these initiatives like this, discussions cannot stop at discussions. They have to start looking at where to go further from here. There has to be a way forward. And I don't think, see, we all discuss in various uh -huh. forums. And the discussion ends at that. It just becomes a discussion. We meet old friends. And this has been a great forum because I think I'm meeting Dr. Rajiv after years on this forum. Uh, Gautam I've met in his different avatar in the past. Puneet I have spoken to. So it's been great in that sense. But beyond this, this this meeting must result in something beyond it. And we do expect an organization like not NatHealth to take that forward. I mean, it is only with such organizations that the power to create the change or at least initiate the change exists. We will participate in furthering the change and we inputs to make that change happen. But the initiator has to be organizations which are in a space like what that helps. So I, we do expect that from you for having spent our time here. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much for, uh, uh, for, for your words. Uh, uh, we are now at a conclusion of the session. And I think there are immense takeaways from what has been discussed by all. If I were to recap, it would take another a long time. So I'm just going to put in some words over here said by all of you to have a, you know, a more succinct kind of a recap. Uh, I think we need to look at a, at a ecosystem. That's the first thing. We need to look at an ecosystem that has a symbiotic relationship. We need to look at terminologies, which like Gautam and Dr. Uma have said, we need to look at respecting each professional professionals at all levels into this entire healthcare system. And then we also can really put in a word, which is uh, um, by, by Puni, that we need to have involvement of the public, uh, public sector and the private sector, wherein the private sector is a welcome with open arms and that is how this whole system is going to be built so uh that's that that would that's my short recap since uh, uh we are uh, short of time and thank you anvesha thank you to the avian team who has organized all of this 